all the monster hits from the icon who invited an entire generation to his party. But who was he off stage? I'm Prince. I haven't given you enough time to freak out. You may do so now. A rare glimpse into his private life. And beyond the music, the man who got him out of a contract that he says made him a slave. And he said, well, if you get me free from Warner Brothers Records, I'll take slave off of my face. And Purple Rain, from Screen rain. to Super Bowl Extravaganza, the autobiography and the anthem. Y'all been waiting on me? The legend, the mystery. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. David is away tonight. Icon, legend, phenom, wizard, trailblazer, rule breaker, prodigy. Just some of the words being used tonight to describe Prince. He wrote a haunting song called Comeback after the death of his baby son, and one lyric says, Spirits come and spirits go, some stick around for after the show. Don't have to say I miss you, because I think you already know. But fans tonight are saying I miss you, and our Dan Harris is with them now, right outside Prince's hit factory, Paisley Park. Dan. Elizabeth, good evening to you from Paisley Park Studios, where Prince worked, lived, and ultimately died. Behind me, you can see a growing memorial to the global pop icon so beloved by the people right here in his hometown, waving to the camera tonight. And look at the fence there. You can see a sea of purple balloons and flowers, a fitting tribute to a man known as the Purple One. And beyond the fence, the sprawling 46,000 square foot complex, which sits on more than nine acres of land. This is where Prince recorded nearly 30 records and where he was found dead on Thursday morning inside an elevator on the first floor. And tonight, so many questions swirling around this case with the local sheriff now promising to leave no stone unturned. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. They gathered here in Minneapolis today to celebrate the life of Prince, but also to try to make sense of his mysterious and untimely death. Here at Paisley Park, where Prince both lived and worked, they came to honor a native son who became a global pop icon. How did you feel when you heard the news today? Devastated. It was 9.43 Central Time Thursday morning when sheriff's deputies found the music legend unresponsive inside of an elevator that led to his living quarters. It was sudden, but not entirely shocking. I'll just last month, Prince appeared the picture of health showing up courtside at this Golden State Warriors game. April brought the first signs of trouble. At the Fox Theater in Atlanta on April 7th, organizers canceled two concert appearances, saying the entertainer was battling the flu. But just last Thursday, Prince was back in Atlanta to make up for those missed shows. By all accounts, he gave his usual strong performance. Yeah. He left everything on the stage. He gave us his all. He did around four encores. Just hours after the show, however, as Prince's private jet was winging its way home to Minneapolis, a medical crisis. The plane was forced to make an emergency landing at 1.30 in the morning in Moline, Illinois, an unresponsive person aboard. Moline, uh, Jet P990, now 127. The celebrity gossip site TMZ broke the story. They took him to the hospital, and after doctors looked at him, they said, look, you're going to have to stay for 24 hours. Curiously, TMZ's Harvey Levin says because no private room was available, Prince left the hospital after just three hours and flew home. The reps for Prince told us it was because of the flu. That never made sense to us because with the flu, you tough it out for 48 minutes so you can get home and you're comfortable rather than in some strange city. However, the next day after returning to Minneapolis, Prince tweeted out this flyer announcing a dance party that very night at Paisley Park to give thanks for the good weather and for all the love and support. Sharon Jackson, who works for the local paper, the Star Tribune, attended the event, not as a reporter, she says, but as a fan. He seemed great. He seemed totally fine, energetic. It just strikes me that what you're describing does not sound like a man on death's door. I certainly did not get that impression when I was there. He spoke for a couple more minutes, and, and he said, wait a few days before you waste any prayers. 
After the show, Prince tweeted out this picture of the crowd and a message. Thanks, everybody, for your extra time. On Wednesday night, outside this Walgreens drugstore near his home, Prince was seen in this photo that TMZ says it obtained, perhaps the last image of him alive. Just hours later, on Thursday morning, Prince was found dead at his home. As his body was released to his family today by the medical examiner, we learned that the riddle of what caused his sudden death almost certainly won't be solved until we get back the results of that autopsy, and that could take weeks. We are going to leave no stone unturned with this and make sure that, uh, uh, that the public knows what happened. But the sheriff said over and over in his news conference late today that we should not expect any quick answers in this case. Interestingly, he and the other local officials volunteered that they, too, are Prince fans, which is part of why they're treating this case so carefully. As the sheriff told the gathered reporters, to you, Prince Rogers Nelson was a celebrity. To us, he was a community member and good neighbor. Elizabeth, back to you. A beloved community member. Thanks so much, Dan. An early manager of Prince once said that the thing Prince feared most was being normal. No worries there. He wrote his first song when he was just seven years old, and it was called Funk Machine. Chris Conley has what happened after that. His music fused funk, R&B, and rock and roll into the most adrenalized sound of the 1980s. His hypersexual image yeah. redefined masculinity for a new age. My name is Chris, and I am he was a rock star who didn't look like what some people thought a rock star was supposed to look like. Blessed with swagger, seductive allure, and a level of technique that his peers knew was off the chart. He's the best pop musician that ever lived. He could do it all, and he could, you know, he would. Prince would take the instrument from you and play it better. A prolific, ceaselessly creative musical visionary on every front. He was a game changer. One of the rare combinations of great musician, great singer, great songwriter, and great conceptualist. If you had a picture of the word prolific and you had to put somebody's picture next to it, it would be Prince. He was not confined by rules of race, sexuality, style, music. He had his freedom. Pushing limits in total control of his groundbreaking look and sound with the aura of danger that cutting edge artists are meant to have. When he was young, what were his dreams? He wanted to be Elvis. child of a jazz singer mother and a pianist father. How can I put this? My father was, he was so hard on me. He, he, I was never good enough. And Prince Rogers Nelson grew up in Minneapolis with musical influences that span genres, from Joni Mitchell to James Brown, a whiff of Minnesota's Scandinavian melancholy, and the Twin Cities' funky town. Won't you take me to Prince was kind of shy as a kid, I guess. Um, I never thought of him like that. Whenever there was music involved, he was the exact opposite of shy. I mean, he really loved music. You could just tell that it was just in him. You're very sweet, but you're very much to yourself. Okay. And shy? Mm, I wouldn't say much. Okay. He didn't say much of anything, and publicly never would. But from the jump, what he sang was risky, different and just dripping with sex. Every song was either a prayer or foreplay. You know, like, you either wanted to drop to your knees or you wanted to drop to your knees. It was off the rails and irresistible, yet not everyone liked it. When he opened for the Rolling Stones in 1981 in Los Angeles, he was booed off the stage. No big, just two years later, he'd have his first big hit single on a song he nearly gave away to another singer. He wanted somebody else to, to do a little red corvette, and I said, no, 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 and I'm like, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> It's success at the stage for Purple Rain. Purple Rain, Purple Rain. The album would make Prince an undiable superstar in everyone's eyes.
who was tops in the pop of 1984. Christopher Connolly is an associate editor of Rolling Stone. And Prince was the critics' artist of the year. Uh, both the critics and the readers agreed that he was the soul and R&B artist of the year. He would go on to amass seven Grammys and sell more than 100 million records and see his popularity put him in the cultural crosshair. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with magazines. This darling Nikki verse, deemed public enemy number one by the Parents Music Resource Center, with Tipper Gore and Susan Baker eager to slap a sticker on albums with explicitly sexual lyrics. I asked him about the lyrics, and he just said, my generation will understand the real reality of my lyrics. What if Prince remained a witty provocateur, from his diverse, sometimes lingerie-clad band to his famous rear-window jumpsuit? At the MTV VMAs, where, like at the Oscars, fashion was another opportunity for cheeky individuality and defiance of the norm. Using fashion and clothing to further illustrate his creativity. I don't think t-shirts and jeans were his thing. Too pedestrian. The power of all of his work would endure, even as musical tastes changed, and the hits stopped coming with such frequency. Was it difficult for him when hip-hop and rap came on board? And the... Yeah, he asked me, should I learn to rap? See, he'd be embarrassed that I told you that, but I said, I don't think so. Yet as the career honors started to roll in, he proved his musicianship remained without equal. He was back-to-back -back glam with Beyonce at the Grammys. Jammed with Tom Petty. Night he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004. Thank you, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is definitely an honor. The performer with song titles too lubricious to say on network television became a Jehovah's Witness, asking pals not to swear around him. What did matter to him, Bob? That when he did a show, that the band was good, the dancers were good, and that the audience went nuts. That was his greatest joy in life, was man. It's what he thought he was put on earth to do. In recent years, he wrote songs about the devastation of Hurricane Katrina and racial strife in the city of Baltimore. Baltimore. Through his final shows, Prince never lost his belief in freedom, for his own creativity, for other artists, and for his fans. The millions he liberated every time he strapped on a guitar and started to play. Our thanks to Chris. And with fans listening all over again to those indelible songs, the very best of Prince is already slated to be number one on Billboard next week. So, what's your favorite Prince song? Let us know on Facebook and Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And when we come back, Prince's private life. Eat a hamburger in front of him, watch out. We take you to commercial, though, with one of those hit songs, Pop Life. Continues with Deborah Roberts. Every enigmatic superstar has his quirks, and Prince was no exception. The man who could order anything he wanted, happiest with spaghetti and a glass of orange juice. 
Prince was a vegan, a fact his longtime hairdresser Kim Berry discovered years ago. I had brought some Wendy's in, and so he walked past the door and he stopped and doubled back and saw me. He said, you guys didn't give Kim the memo? And he said, nothing comes in my building, nothing with parents and nothing with eyes. But Berry says he did have a sweet tooth. He liked sweets, Tootsie Roll, lollipops. That, that, that was a must, so we always had those. Impatient, impulsive, and easily irritated, Prince was a workaholic and all about control. From New York, I spoke with Barry, who was in Los Angeles. He just wanted us to be classy at all times. We called it the no jeans rule, so nobody couldn't wear jeans on, on, on the road, you know, especially the inner crew, so we all had to stay fly. I, I work for Prince, like I have to be. There's so much about Prince the world never knew because he so famously lived behind this gate. Elvis had his Graceland, Prince had Paisley Park. Prince was very much about creating his own world, and that world had a name. It was called Paisley Park. This was his sanctuary. There he could, he could do him, and he created it. Every room was tailor-made for what he wanted. Everything was custom-made to his liking. These exclusive photos in the Daily Mail take us inside Paisley Park. The rooftop pyramid lit purple whenever the artist was inside. But it was definitely not Neverland. There was no Ferris wheel. There was no menagerie. There's no monkey. There's no uh, zebra. It did have a basketball court, where it turns out Prince was the king. And he could make every shot, any shot, with his left or his right hand. You know, I mean, amazing. In fact, in this classic comedy skit, Dave Chappelle spoofs Prince's basketball skills. The fiercely competitive musician found the skit funny, but had resentment for those who failed to recognize his basketball talents earlier in life. He said, My, I knew I was the best basketball player in high school that they could have had on that team, but that guy never let me play because I was too little. But Prince clearly found lasting confidence in his music. Prince had one woman in mind. He pinned that smash hit back in 1994. A belly dancer half his age named Maite Garcia, who told VH1 her meddling mom connected her with Prince at a concert in Spain. He performed a number that was kind of Arabic style, and my parents were like, Maite, you should get him a tape. Two weeks later, he's in Germany, where we live, and my mom hands a tape to the dancer. Five minutes later, I met him. The couple would marry on Valentine's Day in 1996. He lost um, two children with Maiti during their marriage, and also his own parents, but he never really spoke out about it and almost kept it very, very tight in his own circle. Her marriage ended in 2000, but Garcia says she'll always love the music icon. Prince's second marriage to Manuelo Testolini would also end in divorce. Though there seemed to be a never-ending list of beautiful women who found Prince charming. His protege, Vanity, calling him the only man she ever truly loved. She, too, was 57 years old when she died earlier this year. As for other romances, Sheila E. revealed in her book she not only dated Prince, the two were engaged. Prince did mouth to me as I was playing Purple Rain, playing drums. He turned around and looked at me and asked me to marry him. Kim Basinger, Madonna, and a young girl from Ohio named Tara Lee Patrick, who Prince thought would be better suited named Carmen Electra, all rumored to have dated him. He just never stopped being interested in women and in beautiful women, but in their talent. Yet it was Prince's talent that mesmerized so many. The driven star performing on stage for hours at a time, giving fans their money's worth and more. It was always whatever they wanted. Whatever took them higher, that's what he was going to do. He wanted to give them every ounce he had. So I know when he got to the gates of heaven, he can tell God, I, I left it there. I gave him all you gave me. 
A wonderful thought. Thanks so much, Deborah. And so many hit songs came from that album, Purple Rain. It was filmed at the Minneapolis nightclub, First Avenue, where you can see more Prince fans have gathered tonight. And coming up, we're taking you to a commercial with another song from that album, I Would Die For You. Back now live at Paisley Park as fans gather to sign a memorial for Prince. They've been packed in that park since news of his death broke. We listen, of course, to Thieves in the Temple, one of Prince's top hits. Again, fans have been there all night long since yesterday when news broke. And of course, Paisley Park is the hit factory where Prince recorded so many of his greatest songs. He wasn't just a groundbreaking artist in the music he created, though. He also broke ground in the way music was sold. He fought an epic David and Goliath-style battle against the record industry, and he won. <laughs> When Doves Cry was one of Prince's most iconic hits. The song spent five weeks at the top of the charts, selling two million copies. But even though he wrote it, you might be surprised to know he didn't own it. Most people think a singer writes a song, it's an amazing hit, it's his song. Right. It's not quite that simple. The record company owns the record. So when you want to use that record, you have to get the permission of the record company. And for Prince, that was a problem. In 1993, he began an epic and unprecedented battle with his music label, Warner Brothers, and announced he would no longer be known as Prince, but by this symbol. And a lot of people scratch their heads. Um, you know, what is he doing? Prince began appearing in public with the word slave written on his cheek. This was incendiary. He wanted people to be unable to look at him without understanding what the record industry did to artists. Prince wanted out of his massive contract, and he hired attorney Londell McMillan to make it happen. When you met Prince, he had the word slave written on his cheek. And I said to him, well, how do we get slave off of your face? And he said, well, if you get me free from Warner Brothers Records, I'll take slave off of my face. He wasn't in control of his creative output. He didn't own his masters. And we have a saying, if you don't own your masters, your masters own you. Prince discussed the problem during an appearance on Good Morning America. You know, I don't own Purple Rain, and I don't own uh, When Doves Cry. How risky was this move to take on Warner Brothers in this epically public battle? It was a very, very dangerous move. Dangerous why? Because he had to be willing to walk away from so much. Because we have to remember, at that time in the music industry, record labels controlled everything. Absolutely. He began a partnership and a friendship with a man who had no name, dubbed by the media as the artist formerly known as Prince. You also didn't call him Prince. Prince was very serious about his stuff. This was not a game for him. I actually started calling him the artist. Londell McMillan, he, um... Uh, he started calling me the artist, I think, before anybody. So you'd walk in and say, hey, the artist? <laughs> I would say, what's up, artist? It took almost a year for Macmillan to get Prince out of his contract. Prince's first album, Post Warner Brothers, was fittingly titled Emancipation. In the decades to come, Prince only worked on his own terms. He reclaimed his name. I will now go back to using my name instead of the symbol I adopted as a means to free myself from all undesirable relationships. I said, oh, you want to be a prince now? <laughs> he pioneered new ways to release his music using the internet before anyone else. But without a record label's support and promotion, it was more difficult to sell CDs. Do you think he paid a price by taking on Warner Brothers? Prince absolutely paid a price. Some would say, well, he didn't sell as much and his records didn't receive as much airplay. So it's a flop. So it's a flop. But we would go to shows, and the shows would be all sold out in an hour. 
So he came up with the idea to include the CD along with his concert tickets, which ultimately returned him to the top of the charts. Prince would eventually return to Warner Brothers. Two years ago, he signed a new deal that gave him what he wanted most, ownership of his biggest hits, like 1999. And his victory transformed not only his own creative freedom, but that of an entire industry. Prince really challenged a lot of the kind of preconceived notions of what it was to be an artist and really knocked down a lot of barriers. His legacy now may include even more music. He leaves behind a vault right. filled with music yet to be released. Would he want that music to be out? I think that Prince did not create music for it not to be heard. For Macmillan, there is a sense of pride at having a front row seat to the transformative time in Prince's life and a sense of profound loss. We're going to miss him terribly. But he'll have the heavens jamming and having a great time listening to his, his music. Wonderful tape of Prince jamming to Nothing Compares to You, which could certainly be said about Prince himself. But here's a different take on that song, an acoustic version from someone who's a huge fan and got some pretty good guitar licks himself, John Mayer. What am I supposed to do with this today after you lose an artist and a guitar player such as Prince? What do you even play? again, Chris Connolly. Last night, real recognizing real. The cast of the Broadway show Hamilton, currently at the center of the culture's beating heart, with a post-curtain tribute to another heroic figure, Prince. On social media, Hamilton creator Lynn manuel Miranda giving props to a kindred creative soul. Today we laughed, we cried, we mourned, we danced. What more could we ask of that electric word, life? For the 57-year-old who set the pop world ablaze in the 80s, respect and admiration from those who found their lives shaped by his work. The musicianship, along with the showmanship, along with the songs, the level of virtuosity, that was really unique. Everything that Prince did, you can't think about it without thinking about the talent. Singer, songwriter, guitarist John Mayer, eager to acknowledge the broad extent of Prince's cultural reach from a time steeped in stars. He had all these great musicians. I think Prince is sort of the pinnacle of greatness when it comes to musicians making pop music in the early 80s. I remember a song called How Come You Don't Call Me Anymore. I keep your picture beside my bed. If he only played the piano, you would have said he's one of the best piano players. Mayer says he was still a young child the first time he heard Prince. What did it mean to hear a guy sing that way about sex? I was too young. I didn't understand sexual innuendo. And so I just was like, he's singing about cream, people. You know. This is, a, in, in a lot of ways, a masculine sort of fantasy of being a guitar hero, you know, while also decked out in, in this sort of Purple Rain thing, you know. As an influencer, he extended beyond the confines of music. I don't ever expect um, genius not to come with madness stapled to its back. So I'm easy to please when it comes to somebody being a genius, a true genius. That genius could transform the work of those with whom he collaborated. He brought the best out of people, you know, he, if he wrote a song for you, uh, he would help you to 
going to a place that you've never experienced. For the woman we came to know as she E, that met some big hit singles. Grammy award-winning artist Yolanda Adams was a friend for 20 years. There's not a person, whether they were in country music or jazz or even in symphonic music, that has not heard Prince and has not been influenced by something that he did. Artists like Lenny Kravitz, Beyonce, and Usher. There's just something about a falsetto that I think women go crazy over. You know, if you're able to hit that high, high note, they go crazy. <laughs> so, um, thanks, Prince. Because of artists like Prince, my generation can understand uh, Sex Machine and get up off that thing. And there is no uptown funk without Prince. Bruno Mars, another heir to the throne. Don't believe me, just watch. I think Bruno is definitely the torch carrier to me for just really great music that is global, that transcends, that everybody likes. In his Paisley Park home, this portrait of Prince embracing those who came before him and those he inspired. His passing robs the world of an outsider's voice, someone who understood loneliness and alienation. I don't know why, when, when it comes to artists passing away, I just mourn the young version of them, when they just went, I want to be that. As with so many who changed so much, the hope that they realized what a difference they'd made in people's lives along the way. My thought today when I sat there and really took it in was, I hope he knew that he did it. And he did it better than anybody else ever did it. That's all that matters. Hours after our nighttime conversation, John Mayer put this performance on social media, a final acknowledgement of Prince. Our thanks again to Chris. And taking a look once again out at Paisley Park, fans are still leaving tributes. You can see all the purple balloons, the packs, the throngs, all there leaving mementos, wanting to be together. And when we come back, the Prince, the song that Prince thought was maybe his most autobiographical of all. And an interesting fact, Prince did not sing along in the fundraising anthem, We Are the World, but he did record his own song for Africa, For Tears in Your Eyes. Take a listen. In 1984, Prince jumped from the concert stage to the silver screen, starring in the movie Purple Rain and releasing an album by the same name. By the way, the song Purple Rain since last night has been number one on iTunes. The movie turned a kid from Minnesota into a worldwide superstar. Prince roars into superstardom aboard a optimized Honda motorcycle in 1984, starring in a low-budget movie called Purple Rain. No, Purple Rain blew my, blew my mind, blew my, all my circuits. Music journalist Alan Light wrote a book about the movie titled Let's Go Crazy. Purple Rain, the movie and the album, mark an enormous and dramatic turning point in Prince's career. This movie had no business getting made. Prince was this kid who had a couple of hits. He was not a household name celebrity, and they don't just go around handing out feature films to everybody who's got a song on the radio. The studio wanted to cast John Travolta as the lead, but it was a part own Prince could play. I never meant to call you Prince is star, he's never acted. First time director. Most of the cast is the band, and we're gonna film it in Minneapolis in the winter. I mean, that doesn't sound like a blockbuster. That sounds like a disaster. disaster. But it was a disaster. Was a blockbuster. The movie that seven million dollars to make grossed seventy million dollars at the box office. And the winner of a brand new '84 Oscar is the winner is Prince for Purple Rain. This is very unbelievable. I could have never imagined this in my wildest dreams. By any standard, it's an extraordinary success. And many big stars had tried to make movies. Many much bigger names had tried and failed. Baby, just like my mother. The movie
movie is semi-autobiographical. The Swan Doves Cry, poignant take on the real-life family dysfunction and domestic violence from Prince's childhood. There was plenty of sex and controversy in Purple Rain as well. Was it shocking when it came out? Uh, certainly Purple Rain was daring when it came out for the sexuality. I mean, for, you know, obviously 30 years down the road, this, that, that all looks kind of tame. I mean, people were appalled when they heard Darling Nikki right. and when they saw his performance of the song in the movie. There was intense sexual charisma that was at the heart of what he did. You could have Prince without having that sort of daring sexuality right at the center of it. It wasn't the sexuality where the song Darling Nikki transcended. It was the movie's anthem, Parain. Evoking his favorite color, as Alan Light reveals in his book. Wendy told you, his guitarist told you, about this, quote, it's a new beginning, purple, the sky at dawn, rain, the cleansing factor. If you think of a Prince song and you think of a Prince moment, I think most people would answer Purple Rain is the first thing that they think of. Purple Rain, the album, sold 13 million copies, going multi-platinum. But Prince quickly tired of it. He cut the tour off after six months. He didn't Why? do a second lap around. He did one lap around the States, done. Because I think he realized, I can't go play the same show for the next two years. Prince never gave up on that emblematic anthem. He would play Purple Rain for years and years and years to come in concert. He knew what that, what that song did for him, what that song meant for him, meant for his fans. It comes down to me to the lyrics. When he says, I don't want anything from you except to so you crying in the purple rain? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> At all. But I want to be crying in it. Prince's final performance was in Atlanta one week ago. His final song in that performance, the last song he would ever perform in his life, Purple Rain. How amazing to have been there at that last performance in Atlanta, never knowing it would be Prince's final. And now we're taking a look at the First Avenue Club in Minneapolis where Prince filmed Purple Rain. You can see fans gathered there as well as they have been as well since news of his death yesterday. And as we go to commercial, we listen to another of his hits, Diamond and Pearls. Okay. 